Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this first webinar, which unfortunately uh, is hosted uh, during very difficult times and very difficult conditions. Um, I'm happy to announce that uh, FESH and BSSH uh, together formed a task force for supporting our colleagues and friends in the Ukraine in order to enhance their work they have to do under extremely difficult conditions. I'm very happy that in so sh short time, we could set up a program which is extremely interesting, I think for all of us, but especially for our friends in the Ukraine. So thanks again. I also thank the BSSH uh, with Emma doing all the organization and Andrea Götz from the uh, FESH who is also doing all the backstage work, which is extremely important. I hand over now to Pierluigi Tos, who is kind of the moderator and he's the uh, leader of that task force. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, I really thank you and the BSSH of the opportunity to start with this series. I thanks Andrei Lizak, and the um, Society of the Ukrainian Hand Surgeon that ask to us to help them and all doctors in Ukraine at the moment uh, to help people the better as possible. So we set up with the FASH and BSSH very quickly some uh, Zoom lectures. And this night we have Professor Marko Bumbazirovich that is helping us, uh, that remains in the web to help doctors in Ukraine. Not only hand surgeon, but all doctors that are facing this terrible moment. So uh, I ask Jonathan, if you want to say something from the BSSH. Just to say it, it's a, a huge pleasure to be able to work in partnership uh, to help our Ukrainian colleagues at this really difficult time. And uh, now I think we can start. I want to present you a kind friend of mine, uh, Professor Marko Bumbazirovic. He is coming from Serbia and Belgrade, and he is a Meritron Professor of Orthopedic Surgery in Belgrade. He is a founding president of the Hand Surgery Society of the Orthopedic Traumatology Association and Reconstructive Microsurgery, past president of the European Federation of Microsurgery. And he is very, very, very uh, used to talk about war in injury because he faced a lot of this big problem in his career. So thank you, Marco, for accepting our invitation. Thank you to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Piero Luigi. This is my great honor and pleasure to, to give this presentation, and I hope it can be a, just a little help in the future work of our dear friends from Ukraine. And uh, as I would like to start the talk, can we open presentation? <laughs> Only my name is a little bit misspelled, it's M instead M, Marko Bumbasirovic. Okay, uh, is it okay? Yeah. Uh, now it's uh, one month since the war started in Ukraine and uh, Ukraine people and Serbian people uh, share the same destiny because at the same date, 23 years ago, there was a bombing on Belgrade and uh, the, the, there are different army involved, but uh, the results were the same because there were many uh, innocent dead and injured people and many people had to leave the country as they are doing now in Ukraine. And I perfectly well understand the situation you have here. The, the, uh, I work in Belgrade, I was born and I work in University Clinical Center. And uh, unfortunately, this uh, statement of Hippocrates is uh, true. He who wishes to be a surgeon should go to war. War is the only proper school of the surgery, of the surgeon. So it's true when you face, as our colleagues in Ukraine now, if they didn't have 
opportunity to see the war wounds, you have to, to work promptly and you face serious, serious uh, uh, injuries and you have to make the fast decision and you grow up with this, with this kind of surgery. Uh, my country is in the middle of the crossroads, so we had many, many wars and uh, our one first, the first dean, uh, Dr. Subotic, he published in Lancet in 1913, the paper about reconstruction of uh, arterias in the vessels, uh, blood vessels in the war. And uh, you see this paper and uh, Norman Rich as a father of the modern vascular surgery, Speaking about Subot, he said it is ironic that nearly 40 years passed before similar success efforts were achieved during the later part of the Korean conflict. And uh, this is true. We had some background in war injuries, but we didn't know too much. We didn't expect that war will come again. So we faced more than 4,000 war injuries in my clinical center, and statistics show that blast injuries were most common. And um, this is the health system uh, should be based upon preservation of hospital surge capacity as it is in Israel, but we didn't have that opportunity. So we mixed all the patients together. And these are highlights from cities. No, it's not. So different uh, bombs, missiles, hand grenades, land mines, and all kinds of weapons can damage human beings. Uh, this is a national TV station where also innocent people uh, I was there treating this, uh, 20, 17 people died there, and it was really disaster, like now happening in Ukraine. So th uh, this is also Chinese embassy. I treated Chinese uh, uh, diplomats also and Central Committee of uh, Yugoslavia. So why blast injuries are most common to the, to the extremities? Because uh, body armors, I, it's it's a rule for the soldiers, but when the civilian are injured, it's not the same. And uh, it leaves them always unprotected. Uh, we should re uh, see a little bit about classification of blast injuries. Everybody thinks it's just primary, but also we have a secondary blast injuries. This is our goal of treatment and uh, also tertiary. So these are some new classification. You can find that very easily. And these are primary blast injuries. As you can face, there is not much to do. You see limbs are missing. And uh, sometimes when it's intercalary defect, you can, you can save the limb, but usually. But secondary blast injuries are most important as they are product of shells and flying objects. And you can see the cases like this. This is external fixator. I will tell a lot about external fixation to our colleagues. This is, I, I would say, the most important tool, and you have to have a lot of external fixation, uh, fixators if you want to treat properly the patients. So these are secondary blast injuries. You see different types. And this is tertiary when, when, the, when the people are flying objects and when they fly, they hit the solid object and they, they get severe injuries. This is rarely seen, and this is like this. So, uh, consequence of blast injuries are many. This is oil raffinery, probably I still cough, <laughs> although it was 23 years ago, and uh, they, they produce fractures, amputations, crush injury, burns, cuts, everything you can find in the book. But the problem is there is, the statistics show a low rate of survival after initial traumatic amputation I mean of the major limb. So you have to, to, to be very cautious where is severe amputation, the, the, it's different scenario. So diagnosis is obvious, but this is a key point. Sometimes there is underestimation of the severity. Sometimes with the very fast uh, projectiles, there is a small entering wound with the severe destruction under the, 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 the skin. And so you have to watch and turn the patient to see Proper, proper examination is very important because sometimes you can think that someone is not severely injured and the contrary is different. Uh, many classification can be used, peacetime classifications, but still one. So you need something to, to refer to the patient adequately. Red cross wound classification is good, but it's maybe too complicated for the old doctors and you easily forget it, to be honest. 
but as as is as a in the treatment of mangle extremity all uh, severe injured limb surgeons experience is of the prime importance so you need even if you are best microsurgeon hand surgeon you need to have senior doctors by your side to make decision when to amputate when to save because sometimes you can lose the life trying to save the limb this is from a hospital that also was uh, bombed and uh, the the patients uh, we we always had in mind and uh, that you, and you you should have always always in mind that life is more important than the limb and the uh, reconstruction should be orthoplastic approach i'm orthopedic surgeon and do and i'm doing all kind of uh, uh, reconstructive procedures also many plastic surgeons are uh, very much capable of doing bone reconstruction so the protocol uh, you asked about the protocol you should always give antibiotics when it's possible and tetanus prophylaxis wound irrigation is very important but uh, i would say that more important is the breedment together with wound uh, irrigation and also fracture stabilization if you have a severely destructive uh, limb and uh, maybe sometimes you can do even in the in the difficult conditions uh, bone stabilization external fixation is not a serious operation you have, you can put a pin and to get a stable stable limb stabilization is a key of the success together with the wound uh, 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 irrigation and the brightness so uh concerning the, the 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 protocol for tissue reconstruction we know from the many papers that uh, as early as possible is better but in the war it's different because you always have a high contamination of the wound and you have foreign materials inside so it's not so wise to close the wound but there are some ways i will show you later the technique that we developed that maybe you can try to use and see right in our experience it works very well so secondary reconstruction and always keep in mind that there is big difference between initial and definitive treatment initial treatment should work in favor of definitive treatment but sometimes it's not possible it's better to stabilize limb in in the bad, pos bad position i mean in my uh, if there is mal malposition of the bones is better to have a stable you have to put pins where the bone is good to be to be rigid and then when it's rigid sometimes it's a miracle the the, the bone uh, the the limb vascularity can be regained again it looks pale it looks vascular when you stabilize you wait and you and when the patient gets uh, enough uh, uh, fluids he the, the limb will become viable so the brightness as i said most important this is uh, this is theory wound cover and we developed close up and close technique we published uh, not, not uh, very far away but it, it, it you, you you i will uh, speak a little bit about this but you should amputate if there is no way that you can save the limb it's better to amputate than to to to, to lose the patient's life or to make a very crippled patient this is true what benjamin franklin said involve me and i learn uh, all the doctors from okay uh, i'm sure uh, will be unfortunately in the, this bad situation involve them but uh, there will be better surgeons and they will with easy street later on severely injured limbs if they continue this kind of work so we were using in, in the in the uh, uh, limb reconstructions av fistulas which help us to to bring uh, new blood from the uninjured area we've been using we had near our clinical center hyperbaric oxygen chamber and use deep veins deep vessel because there is uh, obliteration of superficial vein this is one work we did this investigation and uh, there is always severe edema this is issue per se and it's very difficult to 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 fight edema but uh, you be, keep in mind that it compromises your surgical procedures you will lose so bone fixation i would say this is key of damage control orthopedic surgery and you put the fixator we were lucky not at the beginning my war experience started when the, my country 
ex-country Yugoslavia starting to fall apart. They had a lot of patients from Bosnia, Croatia, uh, Kosovo, and the different part of the country. And uh, afterwards, my friend, Professor Mitkovic, he developed this kind of fixator. It's a perfect one because it's, uh, I'm not saying because it's from our country, but I'm using this all the time because it's three-dimensional. It's so easy, you can move the pins in any direction. Whenever you put the pin, you can apply the fixator, which is very important. So this, this experience we had in, in the peace time, we started to use and in the war time, but you should have in mind that external fixation of the hand is specific and very demanding and time consuming because it's not easy to, to put the pin sometimes. So you can stick easy to the K, K, K wire if you have a, a neighboring fingers. If some is not injured, you can use to, to, to put the K wires a different position and to make some kind of rigid fixation so you can debride well and uh, you can follow what's happening with the wound. Afterwards, you can convert this. So conversion of external fixation to internal fixation, it's a big issue. Now it's a rule that it has to be done. All the papers showed better result in mango electricity, NATO policy. I was a panelist in, in many times in the United States with the war symposia, and they, they convert. But my experience, you, you should be very careful about this. Sometimes it's very difficult to convert external fixation because of the state of the limb. It's a polytraumatized limb. And uh, if you have to open again, sometimes it's easier to convert some kind of dif different type of fixator. So you can do uh, bone transport and you can do some other stuff. So it's uh, for, for another webinar, just to discussion what to do later on. But for the first, it's very important to put the X-fix on the right place and to get a rigid limb. I, I mean that it doesn't move anyway. And if it moves, it's a, it's a disaster because you cannot do reconstruction of vessels. You cannot do reconstruction of the nerve. And then uh, finally, you will have for sure infection. I, we published this some, when we were uh, first uh, symposium of war injury was organized by American Academy and uh, American Army. I was there and uh, we published then a paper in American Academy, Journal American Academy. You can find some data, some stuff. This is actually based not from the, that war, it came lately from Syria and I, 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 we did just a, a perforator flap and this is our fixator. You have to fix shoulder injury. If you don't have anything, as you show in the case, you have to fix it to use clavicula or use other side just to have stable. After you have to think, my personal opinion, don't do prosthesis in war, war injured people. You will probably have some infection, but it's some people are doing, but it depends. So what about flaps? Uh, for me, I still have, is this, there is still a place for, for big flaps. I mean, uh, people are speaking about sacrificing the vessels. And uh, I think you have in the war wounds, highly contaminated wounds and with, the, with the lots of destruction to bring a well vascular tissue as, as latissimus dorsi flap is. And it works well, and uh, it brings vascularity. If you do it as a free flap, you 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 put the vessel up in the extremity, and it comes from the from out of zone of injury, and you can bring a good blood here. Another case, and this is this is a mental flap. It maybe looks crazy, but we could not wrap around this 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 forearm, and so we did a mental flap. So this is another case with the uh, with latissimus dorsi. You can see the median nerve is intact. As you said, this you show the case uh, of the severe injury around the shoulder. Nerves are resistant sometimes, and you can be surprised there. If you have nerve in continuity and it looks injured, don't touch it. It's better than any kind of other reconstruction, grafts, or uh, there, there is no place for nerve transfers in such injuries because you don't know which nerve is uh, saved. And uh, so it's very difficult. So, Go stick to the basics. It's a it's a best possible thing you can do, and leave the place for other reconstruction if if, if you can do it. This is a, a guy that came from from Kosovo and he was injured. And the French doctors 
put him, this is a French army fixator and I, I did the flat and reconstruction. I don't, you don't see these patients coming from different parts, but this is this, this kind of, but he didn't have infection. So uh, fibula is a good source, as, as you mentioned in the beginning of this talk, when we spoke, and uh, it works well, we published this and fibula is good, but for my, from my point of view, for the upper limb. For the lower limb, I would like, rather do, if we have a bone defect, just we have a, we, have, we will do, if we have a bone defect, we are going to do a change and to do the bone transport. This is a technique that we developed, close open, close surgical technique. And this is, the story goes like this. You, you put a flap or different flap uh, out of zone of injury, anastomosis, and then, then you remove the stitches. And you can do, you have a flap, you didn't jeopardize, uh, you didn't close the wound, and you can, you can do further the brightness, but anyhow, you have some kind of, uh, you, you cover the bone and you can easily later on close and do other reconstructions. So this technique works very well. I'm doing this now, now in severe injured limbs in other patients, not in war injured. But uh, about what, about the bone, if, if you cannot do the flat, leave the bone open, there is a good paper, a very old one, Colonel P.B. Brown, he wrote from the Vietnam War, The Fate of the Exposed Bone. If you have it stable, you wait and you do some debridements and the bone will cover as, as, as the, the, the vascularity of the bone regain. And this is the key. So this is closed open technique. You see, we did the grafting and uh, the, the final result. And these other, other patients, you, the, the flux and the, the early bone grafting. And also this is primary blast injury. And uh, we managed to save the thumb and we did toe to hand transfer after later on. And this is look like flat hand. This is bone injury and the, the result. And this uh, primary blast injuries, but the fingers were still. So we did some reconstructions and this is this you see the place where we took the vein graft and this thumb survived and some other cases so this is one case shotgun uh, injury and uh, the, the, the we found this here uh, doing this work long time ago duplication of a radial artery there there were two radial arteries in in, in this flat and another case and uh, this case we did the uh, toe big toe to hand transfer. So you can do all the kind of reconstructions better or worse and to, to make, uh, you, I would say, you, useful hand. So, but you should do also, you should not never leave the patients. This is the patient that came like this. We had severe injury and we did the uh, silastic rods and this is, he, he was very satisfied without two fingers and had a very good movement, so. And sometimes you can do just to cover the wound, the bride, and to put the flap like this. And also this, this, this poor man, he had a, a severe injury. It was anti-tank mine. And uh, we did uh, this guy four flaps and uh, he was finally, I would say, okay, but he, he barely survived. He had abdominal injuries. So you, you have first to, think about his more severe injuries than to take care about limbs. So this, this name maybe is not popular now to speak about Russian doctors, but anyhow, Elizarov, Elizarov, we can call it different ways, but it, it works very well. So we published this paper and I would say that it was workhorse for our, I, I, I like fibula very much. I did a lot of free fibula. But uh, free fibula, you have to wait and not to be sure what will happen if you have a big defect. You have to do, do double barrel, what Neil Jones did. And, uh, but sometimes it's difficult. And if you are doing uh, transport, you can obtain union. And uh, you, you, I, I would say you have some uh, uh, situation that, that it uh, works very well. This, is, this, is one, this was one of the, our uh, very important city, he was uh, some minister, and he was, uh, when the uh, when the one building was bombed in Belgrade, he visited what's happening, and the second wave came, second attack, and he was 
just near where the bomb hit and he survived. He had this kind of injury. And uh, this is the, the, the final result. Now he's also a very important person in our country. So these are some cases I will show it work like bread and butter. And this is, this is interesting. This guy, is, uh, uh, his father was from uh, Syria and he was student of medicine and he was injured. And this is, this is his case and uh, the final result. And <clears throat> we did also momentum flap. This is, as you can see, not early reconstruction, but uh, momentum flap, it, although it looks ridiculous, it can, you can cover a lot of tissue and you can use, uh, I would say, to, to, to use the artery through, the, 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 the blood runs through the flap and you can connect to the other artery in the foot and to revascularize with dorsalis pedis also the foot. So some, this is the case and, the, 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 and also some other cases where they did uh, the reconstruction of the, of the nerves and the, and the arteries. This guy was also severely injured. He lost his eyes and he desperately, you know, if you have to amputate, think that uh, with, for the lower extremity, you can go for the amputation if you, if you think that, that the patient will not have a useful limb and will have chronic pain. It's better to amputate because prosthesis for the raw leg work very well. Unfortunately, for the upper extremity, no such a thing as, as prosthesis can, can replace the hand function, and especially aesthetic, aesthetics of the, although uh, severely reconstructed limb looks probably unacceptable, but it's still better than prosthesis nowadays. We are working, I, I especially worked on bionic limbs, we, we published about this, but my personal opinion that you should try to save upper extremity at any cost, if, if no, uh, but not to, to jeopardize the patient, this patient. And uh, speaking about of the sole of the foot is different what uh, Pierre Luigi showed, Calcaneus. Sole of the foot is a very, very problematic. These uh, uh, landmines, they made many damages. Uh, all the reconstructions finally are bad. So my recommendation, we did lots of skin flaps at that time would be better solution muscular flap with split thickness, split thickness skin graft. But it's a matter of philosophy. One webinar could be just devoted to the foot injuries because you will have probably lots of them in the future. So in the conclusion, I would say when there are severe injuries, uh, war injuries, most of them blast, uh, the prevention of complication is difficult, especially in the view of tremendous destruction capabilities of modern weapons. But with a well-organized team approach to this problem, encouraging results can sometimes be obtained even in the most severe cases. So uh, the bribement is the most important step to all of colleagues from Ukraine. Think, take everything out, blood vessels, only be very careful with the nerves because nerve, there is no such uh, sec uh, still we don't have, I would say, predictable result with the nerve reconstruction, especially with the grafts. So don't touch the nerve, wait, probably will recover, and then you can do secondary reconstruction. External fixation is fixation of choice, and you have to do it properly, always putting the pins in the, in the good bones. I mean, to have a stable fins, so if they are safe taping, go directly to the bone. Don't go with the burr, because if you go the, with the burr, sometimes you will put the pin a little bit different angle and uh, they will get loose. I had an external fixator in my patients sometimes staying six months without any problem and any kind of infection. Uh, when possible, do early free flop with technique we show if it's possible, if not, well, you just cover the wound with the, with the, I would say some humid things. And also you can do, uh, you can do WAC, but uh, VAC you can be, uh, you can do it with the, with the uh, aspiration uh, machine and put some spawn as, as they were doing a long time ago in Israel. And uh, you can clear the wound like this. And, uh, in the end, I would say the lip service surgical procedures are important, but life 
for sure is more important. And uh, what this is what happens with the wars. War does not do determine who is right, only who is left. And uh, we don't know much about wounds still. We have to work. We don't have ideal solutions. We have to take from the, from the, from the limbs or from the body to, to put to other place, but anyhow, we make some uh, donor side problems. So we surgeons, we should stick as a family. I have many friends around the world, many good teachers. And uh, if, if I can in any way help our colleagues with any advice, I will, they can freely call me if they think they will need for that. Thank you very much for the intention. And I'm really sorry what's happening in Ukraine. And I hope the war will stop immediately. And uh, we don't need wars. We need, we, need, we need more happiness in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco, for this overview of uh, what we can do uh, from the emergency, uh, also for other procedures that uh, we will talk about uh, in the future uh, webinar. So if we have not uh, immediately answer uh, question, sorry, uh, I ask uh, to Andre uh, to say us, uh, which are the basic things that we have to keep in mind uh, for doctors that face uh, an, an accident immediately. So how to wash, what we have to do, how to remove uh, all problems. So what, what do you think, Andrew, that uh, we can do immediately, basic things? Uh, thank you, Pierluigi. First of all, like Marco said, uh, limp is important, but life is more important. So first of all, we uh, should think about life of the patient. And if we have, for example, vessel injuries that uh, have, have been done a few hours uh, ago, for example, six, seven hours ago, we don't know how uh, much uh, time we need to reconstruct this uh, artery about amputation because if we uh, reconstruct artery myoglobin can go into the blood and uh, block our kidneys so uh, block patient's kidneys and we can lose the patient so first of all life limb is important but life is more important uh, then uh, the brightman the brightman the brightman the brightman the brightman is the most important step uh, to deal with uh, the wound. We should uh, excise all the tissues, uh, everything that we think uh, would be dead, and uh, we should go for a debridement a few times. Uh, for example, patient just go, coming in to hospital, uh, he is stable, everything is okay. We take him to OR, we debride everything in the wound. We can take off the part of the clothes in, in the wound, from the wound, uh, some other things from the wound, even the shrapnel or bullets or something uh, uh, in the wound. Uh, we should debride every dead tissue. Then we uh, uh, stabilize the wounds for somehow. And uh, for example, the next day we should go and uh, look at the wound. If we see new dead tissues, we must debride. We must debride, debride, debride before the wound is clean. Then, third, uh, ex external fixation is the fixation of choice, uh, but pins must be placed in the good bone. Like Marco said, uh, we uh, should uh, put pins in the good bone, not in the fragments that uh, move, uh, not in the dead bone, in the good, healthy bone. Uh, if it possible, we should uh, close uh, the wound when we can do this. E when the wound is uh, plus or minus uh, clear, we can, if, if it possible, we can uh, make a free flap, cover the wound, 
then unstitch the wound, the bride more, unstitch the bride more, cover the wound until our wound is uh, clean. If we don't have the possibility uh, for uh, the free flap, the bride the wound until it uh, is clean, and then we can apply work or and negative pressure uh, devices that uh, help us to grow uh, granulations that help us to close this wound. And when we uh, can do, we should uh, think about closing the wound, uh, about uh, how we can close the bone and um, other structures. Uh, vessels is important, but as I said before, uh, we should understand the time of ischemia and the time that we need to restore uh, the vessel because uh, if we late, we can be too late and we can uh, lost our patient. Uh, nerves, nerves is important. We should try to preserve ner nerves. Uh, and if we uh, go for a revision and we said that, and we see uh, that nerve is incontinuous, that it is uh, not damaged, we should wait and see, wait and see. We shouldn't try to make uh, an early uh, uh, reconstruction is if the, uh, if the nerve is, isn't damaged. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we should wait and see. Uh, then- uh, Sorry, I, I, I ask you, what about also to Marco? Uh, how do you wash your wound? Uh, you have to pee. And uh, uh, Marco, do you believe in, in uh, pulsate or you, you believe in washing a lot? I, 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 you know, I'm old school. I believe in washing, as you said, 10 liters, 20 liters, whatever you have. Yeah. The battlefield, it's a good to, to, to put the water if you don't have anything. It's better it to put very important. Very just important. to wash, just to wash. But also washing too much moving extremity when it's not stable, it's not advisable because you can damage the structures and you can put, uh, I would say, uh, you, you are opening the vessels and you can promote severe infection and sepsis. So you have to be cautious with this. And uh, I say, if you can put a, in the first place, put the fixator, if you, if you can find the pieces in the intact uh, part of extremity and do washing and the brightening. Although protocols are not like this, but this is, I, I would suggest to the colleagues and you will have a better result and you can see what, what uh, you said, if you don't have vascularity, if you stretch the limb and fix it, even the bones are malalignment, in malalignment, you can get vascularity with the, with the bridges of soft tissue and you can save the limb. If you leave it like this, mangled, and the wait, and he waits for triage and everything, then he can lose the limb because there is a reversible uh, damage and clots in the vessels, in the, in the microcirculation. It, it goes especially for the hand, some piece of the skin, you are micros, you do replants, but you, you are happy when you see the piece of the skin and there is maybe one or two veins there. So if you, if you suture the artery, the job is done. But if you don't have this small piece, uh, this is sometimes can be a problem. This goes also for the major limbs. This is my advice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Me too. I, I like to just wash uh, the wounds, maybe with maximum with my uh, syringe, but I'm more likely to uh, wash it from uh, the cup and yes. uh, wash, 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 wash uh, until it's all clean, until we uh, have everything clean that can be mm, a liter or something like that. Uh, of, uh, I, I like to use a silen or uh, uh, maybe- Whatever you have. Or, yes, or, or whatever you have, yes. Uh, as I said before, some, uh, 
a new uh, evidence-based data said that pulse lavage, pulsative lavage can even uh, make worse because it can even uh, damage uh, tissues more and uh, make infection even deeper. So uh, I don't li like pulse lavage, I like uh, just to wash. I, I think personally that uh, pulse lavage is overrated in both ways, in, the, as a, in good and in bad. I think lavage is enough, but pulse or not, or this, you, you have to put a lot of water and to look for the foreign materials. But uh, you will have these patients forever if they live in your neighborhood. You will never finish with the infection. Infection lives with the patient with severely, especially blast injured people. There are always shrapnels inside. There is, you never know when they will come to start to work and to, to have some kind of infection. They come, doc, I have, a, and you give some antibiotics, you, you, you do some uh, debridement and, and it settles down. And uh, the, 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 sometimes he comes after five years again. So you will have always potential infection with this kind of limbs and so my proposal is not to, to hurry with prosthesis afterwards. After when the, when the war finished, I hope, I hope today's uh, 24, I hope you'll finish tomorrow. So I will, we have two, but you will still have patience. Two questions. One is for Marco. What about the late infection because of deep splinters? So what you said now, and the second one, uh, from Gillian Smith, if part of humans are embedded in the wound, should we give hepatitis and HIV phylaxis or are rare problem in Ukraine? So the first one is for Marco and the second one. Ra rate of the infection. <laughs> you uh, can go, yeah. you, you, uh, well, you, you will always have some kind superficial infection it must be existing in the war wounds, wounds. So you always have some kind of infection, but it's important not to have a deep infection. Even if you have the bone infection, you have chronic osteomyelitis, but which is not active. It's better to have a limb like this and we live with such a limb. Patients with the shrapnels in the bone and uh, they have also, uh, uh, this is the uh, matter of debridement. You have to breed all the bone. Don't put the bone back. Better to have empty space this and put the bone back. Important. This is very important. Don't very put important. anything back. Everything's this, out. This, and this, even this, blood vessels, you, you cut it. Cement, some antibiotic cement could be useful or not? Well, uh, don't put cement immediately. <laughs> you cannot put cement. Don't put foreign. You, you, you remove foreign bodies, then don't put foreign bodies. That my, my opinion is it's dangerous. Even this, uh, because the problem is you have to, to, to give antibiotics immediately because you have slowly shut down in the vessel where the zone of injury is spreading. The vessels are shutting, so the antibiotics cannot come to the zone of injury. So you have to do immediately, but it's very difficult during the war time. Where even in the poor countries, in the peaceful time, they when they come to emergency. But very good, important antibiotics to remove everything you see, and tomorrow you, you remove more. And but you have to have a stable limb, whichever part is. And this is the key success uh, rates of the infection. You, you know, you, you read the uh, meta-analysis, you read the papers, who knows? You are not maybe too honest with the, with the but even with infection, don't over, overrate infection. It's better to have a limb. If you have small infection, people can live with this. But uh, living with prosthesis is different life. It's another story we can devote to Thank this. And you, do you have problem of HIV, IV, or hepatitis, or do, do you have do you do a prophylaxis? Uh, we mostly do prophylaxis, and uh, uh, many uh, we 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 don't have uh, many HIV and hepatitis in uh, Ukraine. Of course, we have <laughs> one. That's a pity, but uh, we uh, we do a, a prophylaxis, and uh, in uh, some patients that we uh, can 
think about that this patient can have a hepatitis or uh, HAV, uh, we uh, asked them to make some analysis. analysis. And of course, uh, we uh, should, we as a surgeon should protect ourselves. So we use, uh, we, a, a, everybody in OR and in, uh, in, and while we change in uh, dresses for every patient, we use gloves, we use uh, glass, protective glasses and other things because we uh, don't know uh, about patient everything. And, uh, some patients may not say that these things. So uh, doctors should uh, think about uh, themselves uh, in, in, in the first place. Because, uh, you Jonathan, know, may I ask you some comments? Uh, yes, you may. Yes, you may. I have very little personal experience, yep. uh, but I I'm uh, relaying the ex the experience of others, um, which is to avoid to uh, obviously never close wounds, re uh, debride properly, use absorbent dressings, uh, wash as much as possible, but avoid pulse lavage. Take swabs early. So you, if you do get an infection, you know what it will be before they've had antibiotics, ideally. Uh, that gunshot wounds need less radical debridement than blast. Uh, that cement uh, or antibiotic beads are a bad idea. Um, having another look at 48 to 72 hours uh, is a good time. And use absorbent dressings to start with. Um, uh, to carry the exudate away from the wound. Uh, uh, most of this is coming from the chat. Um, also, we have, uh, if it's okay, we have uh, two questions in the chat in Ukrainian, sure. Sure. so I can translate it. Uh, our colleague from Ukraine asks about using of ultrasound cavitation devices. Do you use it, Marco? No, I don't have any experience. May maybe Pierre Luigi or Jonathan? No experience. Uh, ultrasound? Uh, ultrasound cavitation devices. That's um, uh, for cleaning the wound with uh, some... No, I don't have. No, no, I have no, I have no experience. I'll, I'll ask my experts. But no, <laughs> yeah, Luigi, just yeah. one, uh, one comment. We didn't say anything about using a tourniquet during the bridement. Please. Do you use? Please. Yeah, Please. this is a very important issue. If you, if you have a limb that you had good vascularity, I think you see it will survive. Then you can put tourniquet and then you, you can do much better uh, the bridement and very, uh, the bridement is good when you cut it and when it bleeds. This is the point where you should go with the bridement for the first time. Tomorrow, maybe it will, will not bleed at that point. But when you release the tourniquet, you have a, a over inflow, you have better inflow. And so you will see exactly wh where it's going to bleed and you can cut where it's not bleeding. But if, if the limb is barely surviving, you are not, don't put tourniquet because you can shut down the, the blood vessels that are still working and then can promote vascularity to the foot. Even you can do better debridement with the tourniquet. This is just to say this, this comment. Sorry, I interrupted the colleague Thank from you. Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. If you have a suggestion, I'm, so, I'm sure that Ukrainian doctors are happy to, to know. Uh, do you have, Andrew, do you have antibiotics in this moment? Do you have a problem of that? Uh, we don't have a problem. We have an, an antibiotics and uh, humanitarian aid works well with this. We mostly use uh, uh, big spectrum anti antibiotics uh, for uh, prophylaxis. And if we uh, have, uh, uh, but before using it, we try to make some samples and send them to microbiology. So we know what we are facing. 
And in uh, some cases, when we uh, have uh, um, uh, special, if we can say so, special infection, uh, we use uh, specialized antibiotics to deal with it. So we, we take some samples that uh, we try to take an, uh, about centimeter and centimeter uh, of tissue, of dead tissue. Uh, not, not always it's all dead, but uh, of the tissue uh, from different part of the wound and from the most deeper part of the wound and uh, send them to our, our microbiologist for then before an analysis. So we, we try to use it. We try to use microbiology. Not always it's possible, but uh, we try to use it. Thank you. Thank if, you very much. If you do use microbiology, which is a good thing, it makes sense to take multiple samples because sometimes you get contamination in the lab or in the theater. So uh, we always tend to take four or five samples. And if you take five samples and two are positive with the same organism, you know that you're treating uh, the right thing. Um, the, uh, there was a, a question uh, which is, what, what are the best antibiotics uh, to use, and I assume something broad spectrum, but I'm hoping that somebody with military experience will put something in the chat to guide us. Yeah, we, we mostly use a broad spectrum antibiotics, but if we, uh, if our microbiologist said that there is some specific microorganism, we try to use it more specifically. Uh, we uh, have an, uh, one more question from uh, Ukraine uh, about uh, uh, drainage of the wound. Do you use uh, which? I. <laughs> Suction method to, yeah. to drain. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Drain. How do you drain drain your uh, wounds? Your, your open wounds. <laughs> if it's open, it seems. Uh, uh, after, for example, uh, when you use this uh, technique, close, open, close. Uh, yeah. Marco, how do you use a uh, drain? No, you just rinse. You rinse with a lot of. Uh, fl fluids. You with lots of saline. You rinse and you debride, but you very carefully, not not to put the pressure where, where the anastomosis is and to to avoid this kind. But you open all all the flap all around. The key also you have to when you plant you take a bigger flap because it will shrink. It will shrink by the time, so you will not be able to close it later. So put it bigger and to be to be a loose. And when you open the, you can flip flip it over. And with the assistant, and you can rinse, and you see what's going on there. And to cover the bone, or if there are some tendons, they will not uh, cover by itself. You will lose tendons. If if but the, if there is saline and there is a soft tissue, you can save this. And much you know, it's not only to save the rim to save the function. So this is the key. You you rinse, and you can do as many times as you want. So this is very good. I I, I save many limbs like this, I think so. And also we were, we were sending patients to the hyperbaric oxygen chamber cannot save a vascular limb, but it's, it's little, it helps. You see the results when you, when, you, when, when you have opportunity to send them. And especially the, the, the borderline cases also, when it has uh, something is dying and all, you cannot save the flap with the hyperbaric oxygen chamber, but you can save something, some parts of the tissue. And after this, this part of tissue can promote granulation and you can cover the wound. You shouldn't cover, you, you, uh, lower extremity is different, I will say much than upper extremity. The upper extremity, you have to think about the function. Uh, blind fingers mean nothing, not too much. But even like this in, Places where we live, Mediterranean area, people 
they 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 want to have their limbs. They 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 not easy go for amputation and family. So if you have to amputate, do it immediately. And uh, if the patient stays for months and then you decide to um, to do amputation, it's very is disaster for the patient, for the family, and also for the surgeon. But sometimes you have to do it. You it don't is, know what uh, you're sometimes it's very difficult. Yes, we know we know to 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 know if it's important to amputate. We know that it's important to amputate, but sometimes it's difficult. Uh, which is the level of amputation in the upper limb that you prefer? So always, the, we always try to keep as much as long as possible what you suggest. Uh, 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 if you ask me? Yeah. I think uh, for the upper limb, we don't have special area. If it's, uh, I think it's better to, 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 to save as much as you possible. Okay. So you can do yeah. prosthesis, you can do to cover maybe something like Wilkie's procedure to make a useful limb and to have sensitive, if there is a sensitive skin, it's better to have a longer limb for everything. For, yeah. for, this is my personal opinion. Yeah, there is no good, yeah. such a good place, even for the lower leg. People are going, you know, lower leg is for conventional prosthesis, but if you have a prosthesis that uh, the, is also integrated, it's better to have a longer limb because maybe the future of also integrated prosthesis is coming where you will not have a problem with infection and all these kind of other prosthesis will be history. So better to have more material than and to, to have this pro, uh, the guy that make prosthesis make a bigger problem than to cut when it's easy for them to make prosthesis. Always think about patient. This is my opinion. Thank you, Marco. Do you have some cases that you want to show us, uh, Andrew? Uh, yeah, uh, you really then we can close when we discuss these cases if we have no other question. Uh, Yuri? Oh, one, one second. Okay. Uh, my cases? Yeah, yeah, your case. Good. <laughs> nice. Uh, so uh, the first patient, uh, male, uh, 49 years old, uh, he had a gunshot wound. Uh, that's our special forces fighter, uh, like uh, from seven or eight meters with uh, AK. Uh, he got uh, his uh, first metacarpal bone fracture with uh, lots of fragments and uh, defect, uh, damaged uh, EPL and uh, EPB and uh, skin and soft tissue defect. Uh, so, uh, that the photos immediately after the operation. Um, I fixated the thumb with uh, 2K wires and uh, repaired uh, the tendons. Uh, so uh, if tendons repaired, uh, I had to cover it with uh, actually local skin craft. That's a post-op uh, X-ray. So, um, we can see that there is a, a basis of uh, the first metacarpal bone with a joint. Uh, so uh, that's uh, the photo where I took off uh, some stitches because there was exudation from the wound. And uh, then I took uh, some more stitches. And uh, the next two photos is actually made uh, yesterday. You can see some ischemia on the flap, but uh, it's going pretty well. Uh, that's the back. Now, what uh, plans? I'm planning to make a full thickness graft uh, to the back and uh, to restore the bone. Uh, maybe. Uh, if I can, uh, I'll try to restore the joint, uh, uh, metaphalangeal uh, joint, uh, probably with uh, articular uh, cartilage or maybe tendon. Actually, we've done a couple of this and uh, we had uh, pretty good results, like 50% uh, of uh, movement. <laughs> 
So uh, that's the case. Uh, if you have any advices, uh, I will listen. Uh, I, I would like to, to make a comment. This yes. is a very good, you, you did a great job. And uh, only one thing you should keep in mind when you have, you see you have a chronic edema. Then you have to think about when you have a not injured other part of the hand about metacarpophalangeal joints. You have to put them in safety position. Sometimes it's good with, because you have edema to put a 90 degrees metacarpophalangeal joint, put K wires to fix them like this. And then you will have easy because sometimes they, they can, they, they have a very hard time to get the functional metacarpophalangeal joint, especially if you have some problem on the dosum because the, if there is a shrinkage of the skin, and then you have a problem, you will see. And uh, concerning the, the thumb, you did a great job. If it has a th thinner function, you have just to put conventional bone graft and you can fuse the, the uh, metacarpophalangeal joint and uh, with a good uh, thinner function, he will have almost full function of the thumb and good result. Only what happened with the nerve, does he have digital nerve injury? If not, uh, you did no, a no. great job. You uh, did a great job. Great job. Thank you. So, thank you. So, so try to, to, to bend these metacarpal phalangeal joints because you will have better time when you when you see patient in when he recovers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll do it. He is actually here, uh, not with me in the room, but uh, he is in uh, our department and I'll probably do it uh, after meeting. Okay. And some more comments? Th thank you, very nice case and, and treatment. Uh, I think you can wait for the dorsal part of the hand, let it move. And in my mind, if you put a little piece of cement in this, uh, where, where we have no bone, probably your future is, is easier. Now put bone in that place is not so easy. Like also, space, or you so I, 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 I suggest you to do that uh, not immediately, but in in few months. So wait, wait that all is closed and aligned. Okay, thank you. The second case. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So uh, that's a female, uh, thirty-nine years old, uh, uh, got wounded uh, by artillery strike. Uh, with uh, Smirch, uh, she said actually her dog said her, pushed her down. And uh, she had uh, radius and uh, ulna fractures uh, with uh, bone defect, uh, you can see on X-ray, uh, damaged uh, radial artery and uh, radial nerve and uh, pretty big soft tissue and uh, skin defect. Uh, that's the... Uh, uh, X, later x-rays uh, when she came to our department. She was uh, uh, started the operation in uh, another clinic. I was uh, called there. Uh, so um, the orthopedic surgeons already done external fixation and put two Elizaros wires uh, into the ulna. Uh, so we came, we do debridement and uh, repaired uh, radial nerve and artery. And then we had to hide them with uh, muscles uh, that left, extensor muscle. Uh, so um, she came after a few days, uh, she came to our hospital. Um, we decided to put the walk therapy on the wound, uh, actually called a septic surgeon for uh, advice and uh, uh, she uh, got worse, uh, temperature went high and she felt not good. So I decided to, to take off uh, the walk and uh, do the second uh, debridement. Uh, that's uh, the photos uh, right after the second operation. Um, now she feels much better. Uh, she has no temperature, but uh, I don't know if that's the last uh, debridement. Uh, 
I'm planning to put WAC again. If uh, wound is normal, uh, then uh, close uh, the defect with uh, full thickness skin graft or maybe uh, some flap. Uh, and uh, then um, after everything heals, uh, probably we need to restore the radius, a bone graft, uh, maybe fibula, and uh, tendon transfer because uh, radial nerve was uh, torn from distal part uh, all the way through. We repaired it, but uh, I actually don't think it uh, that extent, some extensors will work. Uh, so she will need tendon transfer in future if everything uh, else is okay. Uh, do you have some advices, please? This is yeah, I, okay. As you want, okay. Marco, uh, you are right. You did perfectly. Uh, it is not only a problem of the nerve, but you do not have the muscles. Uh, so uh, we will talk about nerves, nerves injury during the world in the next few uh, webinar. Uh, normally do not have to, to repair nerves in this situation, just to find if you can, the, the two nerves that you can repair later, but leave them there. It's not important to, to do that immediately. In this case, you have no muscle. So it's obvious that uh, in the future you have to do some uh, tendon transfer. So you are right, perfectly. Uh, well, I, I would suggest uh, this, this one does, does not look like uh, infected or something. I will do flap here. I will do flap and prepare for fibula later on. Not uh, fibula immediately, but do the flap. It will make a much better position for the elbow because he has ulna. I didn't see well the joint, but I think he has uh, uh, ulna in place. So maybe they, they can, some, in the future, if they do flap, they can loosen the, the clamps and st start a little bit of passive motions. And concerning the, the radial nerve, is it high radial nerve pulse or low? If it's low, probably in the future, you should do, if there is a pronator teres, uh, you, you should do to extensor carpi radialis uh, brevis to do, to do internal sp the sprint of the, of the hand, to, to put hand in the, in the dorsal position and you make life of the patient much better waiting for the big transfer or if, there, if, if, the, if, the, if the vora side is good for transfer. But you can do pronator teres to extensor carpi radialis brace and to uh, six, six, six weeks to, to, to sprint it and then the patient can get the function of the hand, move the fingers and also do passive, a little bit passive motion on the elbow with the flap you can do flap here with no problem. He will not have problem, I guarantee. This is my Thank advice. You. Thank you. I'm just planning to wait for a couple of days because at first the wound was good too after the first debridement and then it uh, got worse. Uh, we, uh, unlike our colleagues in Kyiv, uh, right now don't have uh, ability to take samples because our laboratories uh, don't work right now. So uh, we treated uh, it with uh, wide spectral antibiotics. Um, I probably, I think I should wait for a couple more days. It's, yeah. not, it's, it's a, not easy to cover that area with a flap. What do you suggest, Marco? You no. have to suggest, sorry, you have to suggest to people who are used to do microsurgery, and this is easier. But if you have not the microsurgery, what do you uh, It can be difficult, I, I agree. But you need a good skin here. If you, if you have a scar, he will not have a good movement of the, of the elbow. So this is my opinion. Maybe they, they should try to do, uh, okay, if it's difficult, then they, can, they can wait, yes. Okay. The flop you did <laughs> today. <laughs> yes, you need microsurgery. So yeah. I think that uh, 
Jonathan, if you want, we can close and say something about the next time, next uh, Thursday. Uh, if you have other question, I, uh, they are asking if you need some material for doing splint, if you have material to do splint. Y yes, I do. We, we have, have some plastics, uh, we okay. can do splint. Okay. Treated patients very well. I congratulate. Thank you. Uh, can you suggest flap or like uh, free flap or some free flap? Free, free flap. flap. Yes. Yeah. So maybe. You know... Marco, go. Yeah. No. 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 Okay. You. If you know how story. to do microsurgery. You can use uh, the flap you prefer. We, we, there's not strict rules for that zone. So everybody of us choose uh, the flap you prefer. I love uh, ATL if the patient is not uh, big or, or with uh, a fatty, big fat tissue. But you can also put a muscle. You can do really what you want. You have to cover it. And uh, because that tissue for the elbow is very, very important. It's, it's correct. Uh, if you if you want to to uh, to close it without a flap uh, in the future also will be very difficult to do other other things then you can close immediately try to stop the problem then you can put a, a free flap for the with the fibula flap and the skin yes. in the same time yes. you can do also that but really you have to be very scared very 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 advanced microsurgeon to do that very skills sorry uh, I guess uh, we can do that uh, at good, one time. Good. If you uh, do that, it's perfect. Perfect. No, we can do that at ah, one okay. time. Maybe. <laughs> then you uh, can close the problem and send to others. We are, we are, you are not in a hurry. You have not to solve the problem immediately. Don't worry. Yes, that, that's true. You are not in a hurry. Thank you. Thank you for your advice. Jonathan, did you want to close? or uh, Andre, as you want. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to close. So I think this has been a great start. It's fantastic to see that we've had uh, 200 participants. And from the chat, it's clear that uh, many of them have significant military experience. Uh, it's a lovely talk with uh, some great examples. Uh, but I think going forward, it's clear that we, we need to do uh, additional uh, webinars on managing burns, nerve injuries and reconstruction, uh, fasciotomy and vascular repair. And also we're working with our sister org organizations uh, to provide some teaching on managing lower limb and major trauma. Uh, next week, um, Sarah Stapley, uh, a naval surgeon, uh, from Portsmouth, who's done eight uh, tours of duty uh, and also uh, has uh, worked with the Birmingham uh, group where most of our reconstructive efforts have been centred, um, will, uh, uh, will give us a talk um, looking at the uh, focusing really uh, on basic principles of the initial uh, management and some lessons uh, that we've learned from uh, our experience of conflict injuries. Uh, so uh, great to, to see everybody. Love, lovely to be able to discuss some ca cases. Uh, amazing to talk to Yuri, who can't put the lights on because he's being shelled. Um, and uh, our thoughts and prayers uh, are with you in U Ukraine. We hope that things will finish soon. And, and then we can all concentrate on clearing up the mess uh, that's been left. So thank you to everybody. Uh, see you next week. Thank you very much, thank Marco. You. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Jonathan. Next week. Next week. <laughs>